Hello guys, uh, so as you guys can see today we're going to talk about cutting back processing time, <laughs> how to execute multiple things at the same time, that's the topic of, of the talk today. And I know this is kind of kind of controversial uh, subject in PHP, so before I start diving into it, I'm going to talk, I'm just going to present you guys this guy, this guy is Ed, he's a friend of mine, such a nice guy, a nice fella. He likes apple juice, for example, and, but he's very critical and it's like always like questioning, which is kind of good. So when I first show at the, the about this talk, she said, but Muji, which is my name, by the way, <laughs> uh, but Muji, PHP was not made for that. And then I said, but a lot happened since 1995, right? And I said, a lot happened since 1995. At and then Ed replies, yeah, but there are better options rather than use PHP for that Muji. And then I kept going because, you know, I like Ed after all. <laughs> there can be, but that doesn't mean that we should just ignore it, Ed, right? But, you know, Ed doesn't give up and he starts talking, no, but you could use so many different things. You could use like Docker if you want, supervisor. There are so many options. Why one's a PHP? And I said, well, no, we should try. PHP is, is growing, and I think we have to, you know, try all the possibilities. And but then Ed said, you know, I don't like to use PHP for that emoji. And then because I like Ed very much, I said, oh no, that's was not what I said to Ed. <laughs> I said, well, PHP supports it, so I think we should give it a shot. And you know, it's fine if you know what you're doing. And one thing about this kind of this kind of process is that much people they use it but are not really familiar what what are even the terms. So let's talk a little bit about it. For example, concurrence and parallelism is really like really easy to misunderstand them because they're they might be they might even do the same thing depending on how they are put. So it's kind of difficult to kind of understand. So I'm going to talk about the first one, concurrence. So the thing is, uh, concurrence in, in the concur concurrence process, what you do, you are like switching tasks. You, you know, like us that we are um, human beings, we are not able to do two things at a time. Although we fool ourselves, like, I don't know, like brushing our teeth and like try to comb your hair, maybe like, uh, I don't know, smoke a cigarette and try to try your shoes or work and visit Facebook. So we fool ourselves every day thinking that we can, do two, we can do two things at the same time, but actually we can't because, you know, we are limited. That's pretty much how concurrence works. So let's say they wake up and you have like 30 tasks to do. And you're gonna do all of them and maybe you're gonna switch between one and the other but in the end, you're just going to do one task at the time, even if you switch. And that's what concurrence means. And OK, so am I, is it possible that I can do, do two things at a time? Yeah, it's possible, but that's not concurrence. That's parallelism. <laughs> that's pretty much how it ha what happens. So you know, because we're limited. But if we put something else, like for example, if I have a, another arm, maybe I can do one more thing. That's pretty much how parallelism works. So in parallelism, you can actually have two tasks or two processes or two things that we're going to talk a little bit further. We can have there at the same time. So as I said, you can even use both together. But it's really nice that you guys can understand pretty much how the terms are. And if we're going to talk about it, then we can talk about thread, process, and forks. So, for example, we see a lot of people talking about thread, like, yeah, uh, the process is opening a thread. There's a thread on Facebook about politician <laughs> uh, politics. So, uh, yeah, I mean, what is a thread? A thread is actually is a task. That's pretty much what a thread is. A thread is a task. So, uh, for example, when a process starts, it starts with the initial thread. It's called primary, primary thread. And this thread is actually one task. And so when you're running a task, you might have different threads. Uh, as I said, you can even call it task. Um, and 
in a process, they share resources, like memory, for example. So if you have too many tasks, uh, it's kind of like us in uh, real life. So if you have a lot to do, we end up like getting burnout, right? That's pretty much how the process, uh, the, the process works. So if you have too many threads and you cannot control of it, then you run out of memory and then you just cannot do things. So that's actually what a thread is. It's a very small instruction on your program. A process, uh, for example, we can say that a process has a lot of threads. Because if you run a process, which means like a program, for example, you're going to have a lot of tasks running on it. And maybe this program is going to run multiple threads like at the same time, this also can be possible, but a process is really like one thing that is really happening from, w the way from one moment to another. It, it is more like an aggregator of things. One thing that we should, uh, by the way, uh, disclosure, this, this talk is really more about Unix-like systems. Um, so yeah, just good to, to tell you that before I start, but anyway. And a thread contains, uh, and a process contains all the, the states of all the threads. Uh, and, a, and a process also have a process ID, then we can identify the process, a parent ID, so we don't have like orphans kind of uh, a process. Uh, and then it's kind of like a confusing question, right? Because if every process has a parent, must be like, who comes first? Uh, is there like a god who creates the, the man, you know, this kind of, should, something should happen before, and that's w the init program. So we have the init session on, on Unix-like systems, and all the process, they start from it. So every process should have one parent, and every process should have some owner, and by owner, on Unix systems, you guys know that we have all, we have the user, and we also have the group. And on the system, they also have IDs. So for example, for the process ID, we're going to call it PID, which is process ID. For the parent uh, ID, we have the PPID, which is parent process ID. And for the owner, we have the UID, which is the ID of the user that is owner of the, the process. And we have the group ID, which is the group of the, that is responsible. And why is that important? Because if your process tries to write in some directory, it has the, the owner of this process should be able to write on that directory. That's how we control permissions on Unix systems. So if the process has a, a, a user ID that cannot write in certain directory, then we're not going to be able to, to write it, then our program is going to fail. And also, every process has a session. And what is a session? You know, like when you open your terminal, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but you can also have text come back background. But if you close the terminal, what's going to happen to the process that you open? They're going to be closed. And first of all, when I thought about it, I thought, you know, that is because the parent died, but that's actually not it. Because even if you create a background process, which means a process that at certain point is start to run in a different uh, process from this one, uh, I thought that because, the, sorry, because of the parent, because we, as I said, we have a parent, so if a process has a parent, we, all the processes are able to create children, right? So if the parent dies, I thought, you know, that's because the parent died, so I can, so the, the child cannot exist. But actually, that's not true, because what holds it is also the session. So even if you open the terminal, you create a background process, and you even change the parent of this process, if you close the terminal, then the process is gone, because you're not in the same session. So there's a lot of things about process that I think most people don't know. And it's kind of interesting for us that are programmers, right? And as I said, a process can have multiple threads as well. So for example, 
we have one process and multiple threads here. So what is the process here? So the cat is actually playing the keyboard. And for the cat playing the keyboard, he has to use his two arms, right? He has to think about, about the melody. So, but, it's, but in the end, it's just one process, you know? But what if we can just make it better and make more efficient? Then we can have multiple process running multiple threads. So we have two cats, and they're both playing the keyboard. But that might be tricky because the cats need some instruction, right? Like, if they're just going to play by themselves, how they're going to be synchronized? So there's a lot of things that we, not, we have to do in order to keep things better. So one thing there's, uh, uh, we also should know is about forks. What is a fork? That's actually what I was talking before. I was anticipating a little bit. A fork is when a process creates a copy of itself. So imagine that you're running like, like this fella. So he just, he, there, and then he creates exactly the same copy of him. Like exactly the same. It looks like you're running on, the, on a road and then you want to decide which way you want to go or to the right or to the left and you just become two people. You know, that's pretty much how a fork works. And, but the thing is, like, if we're not in this road and then at certain point I, I became two people, then I'm just gonna say, hey, bye fella, see you in the other way, or maybe I'm not gonna see him again, you know? And that's also things that we should keep in mind when, when, you, when you have this technique. Because at that point, then we are two independent people. We have no connection with each other and we can do whatever we want. Okay, this is, was a little bit of a theory about how it works. Uh, process, threads, uh, forks, concurrence, parallelism. And the thing is, as I was saying in the beginning, even though Ed doesn't like it, we can do that in PHP. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit of how we can implement that in PHP. For example, with the threads. Uh, PHP has a library uh, that's called pthreads, uh, which is actually implementation of POSIX threads uh, for PHP. The first version was 2013, but before that there was a lot of trials. So before it became s stable, uh, it was like th the guys had a lot of work and it's really a cool library. And of course, as you guys I don't know if you, everyone knows that, but PHP by, def by default is not multi thread. It's just like single thread. You know, that's pretty much how, for example, the, the nature of PHP is like that. And we cannot execute multiple threads by default on PHP at the same time or try to switch, as I was saying. And how we, how we can use p threads in PHP? I'm gonna show. I hope you guys can read. Oh, my machine was working fine. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty much how, how it goes. So we have this thread class, and it's uh, a class if you extend it, then you can define what's your program gonna run. So do we have a, yeah, nice. So for example, we can create any, this is just my name, it could mean, could be anything, I don't know, uh, and extends thread. Then you have your own implementation of how you're gonna do the task. My, to do your task, you can implement this method called run. And in this case, what I'm doing is, I'm, I'm sleeping for either zero or one, it's going to be Faith who's going to decide, not me. And I'm echoing worker, then it's idea the worker, run. And a new line at the end. So this is how I define my, my thread. So what does it mean? It, does, it means that with this class, if I create like five objects, with, uh, five instances of this object, I can run those five objects in multiple threads. 
But remember that I told you guys that threads are just, they just run once after another, right? One after another, it's just, they're not, they don't run in parallel. Uh, but remember the slides when we have the guy typing and then a new arm came out of nowhere and then he got, he grabbed the coffee? That's pretty much how we, it works with threads. So if we have one, more than one cores on our machine, then because the threads in a multi-threading uh, application sort of thing, so if you have like five processors, then you can run those five in the same time and then they're gonna run uh, at the same time. That's the difference. So they're, they're gonna run in parallel. Even though you're using threads, you run them in parallel. But if you have just, if you just have one core, then it doesn't make sense. You just, you, everything you're gonna do is just gonna run one after another. So putting this code in practice, so I have this four uh, index, index, and then I create an instance of my worker, and then I start here, and then I echo lacquer threads. I know people hate this word, but I like this word. This is my Dutch word that I like most. <laughs> <laughs> and then if I run this program, because my machine has more than one core, then I'm gonna run like five, because as I said, the, the sleep time is Faith who's gonna decide, not me. So five, one, zero, four, two, and then I have lacquer threads. But, but dude, that, that was not what, what the code says, right? Because I had like, okay, I'm creating five tasks, but then I have lacquer threads. That was not supposed to, to happen. But that's actually what I was saying. <coughs> it's running in another CPU. So what happens is that at a certain point, this task was running in a different CPU. It was started, but then this code went here on the front, you know? So that was actually why this is running. This is one more proof that that was running in parallel. Because this task here, it started before this one, but didn't finish until it was time. So with pre-threads, we can also do things in parallel if we have more cores. Uh, but, you know, that code there was not really like really nice and uh, I mean, it could have been better, like a lot of things in life, but how can we just like do the thing that we, we, we want, we just want to have this lacquer, lacquer threads after those tasks to run. And that's pretty much what we want, like if we want a, a mood threading application that's gonna do multiple tasks at the same time, we just don't want everything to happen. Maybe we just wanna wait until everything's complete because just we, ju we just wanna save time for that specific task and then we're gonna do something else. And that's one way to do it. So we have this pool here, uh, which is also a class that you can extend and create a customization of that. So I have final class, worker pool, extends pole. And then here I have any kind of method that I want. This wait method here is a method that I create with the name that I, that, I, that I chose. And then what I do is just I get all the workers. I'm gonna get all the workers that I'm gonna have in this pole and I'm gonna call join, which is actually the thing. This is just gonna wait. This join here is gonna wait until the thread finishes. So this is how we would use it. I'll have like pole, then I have five guys on my pole. It could be any number. And then I have the same thing, but in the pole, I submit new worker threads and then I wait, which is actually my custom methods. So the thing is, it's pretty much the same thing that we had there, but it's more lacquer. No, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. But at least it looks better, first of all. And we have control of everything that is on the pole. We could create, for example, we could create an, an array and just check it afterwards. But, you know, that's... And if we have resource for that, then it's going to be... Let's, let's use it. So, yeah, so wait. And then I, I call Leckard threads. And then that's what I have. So five. It could actually remember that the first one was five, could have been any other number because they're running in parallel. You just 
just got, got lucky. And then I got everything, and then just on the end I got the lacquer threads. Because here, I wait. And this wait, coming back to here, just get the works, and here wait for all the works to run. Wasn't free also the last one before? I beg your pardon? Wasn't free also the last one before? Three? Yeah, I've seen that also, the free was the <coughs> last one. Got lucky twice? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I just copy. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> we'll never know. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The yeah, the sequence is different, yeah. you see. Hmm? You flipped Oh, yes, <laughs> yeah. But it's still they notice. That's so bad. Anyway, so that's how we work with threads in PHP. And it's kind of, it's really stable and it's really easy to, to do. But there's also one another library, since we're talking about forks and process, that we have to talk about, which is PC and TL. This library exists since PHP 4, so, you know, I wasn't even going to school, I guess, when this library was, uh, was started. And, no, I was, just, anyway. And, but this library works only on Unix, like, uh, dif differently from the P threads, because Although it's POSIX threads, there is also implementation for, for Windows to that. But the PC and TL doesn't work. Um, and it's responsible for handling everything about process. So you can create forks, you can, um, can define signal handlers. I'm gonna, we're going to talk a lot about a little bit afterwards about Sinus. Uh, and process termination as well, which is like, you know, I have a process and when I finish this process, how I'm going to do it. So this, this library provides it. But that's the thing, it doesn't work on web servers. So for example, if you're running Nginx or with uh, PHP FPM, it's not going to work. If you're running on um, Apache, that is also not going to work. So it's limited. Uh, as I said before, that Ed was complaining that, you know, it is PHP is not for that, but this is mainly for common line things. It's like, you imagine you have like a huge list of people to send emails. You're gonna just, maybe if you just wait for one to another to send, then it's gonna be a hassle. So this is more for common line applications. Doesn't work on web servers, unfortunately. I'll try to do some <laughs> stuff there. So that's pretty much how this is. Uh, this is pretty much how this is gonna work. And then it comes the fork thing. Remember that I was telling you guys like you walk in the road and then there are two paths and then you say, okay, I'm gonna go this way and then the other guy is gonna do that way. Um, so this is pretty much how it works. And it's a little bit tricky to kind of understand because if you look about it, if you, if you look at this. You're gonna see this is just the same code, right? So I mean, it's just one code. But in the moment that you call this fella here, then something happened. Then is that, that moment that I was talking about, like in the middle of the world, there are two paths, and then I just become two people. So in this moment that I call it, then either if I get a minus one, that means that I have failed with the fork. So the fork failed. Uh, let's create a log here. But if the process ID, which is the returning of this guy, if it's bigger than zero, it means that I created a fork, so the, the creation of the fork was successful. But, as I said, we have two different people now. We have two guys and they have different, different results. So in, it's going to return two results for two different processes. So one process is going to return zero, which is going to be the child, and one process is going to return the process ID of the child. So for example, uh, if the process ID is bigger than zero, then I am the parent process, and my process ID is get my PID, and my child process ID is PID. So this guy held the child ID, and this guy's gonna return the, the, the process ID of the current process. And here I have 
uh, I am the child process, and my process ID is get my get get my PID. And you see that we are calling the same function, right? And it's the same code. But if I go a little bit further, so this is where we are going to we, we call the same function. Remember, get my PID was here and here. But they're returning different results. That's because one is another process, and this is the person that was just born. And this is my child process ID, and the child that I was returning by the PCNTL fork was the same of this process ID. Do you guys follow? Yep. Okay. Okay. So if the process ID is zero, I'm guessing that's it. Yeah, no, no, the process, if the, yeah, if the process ID is zero, that means that it's the, it's the child. Okay. Yeah, that's why mm -hmm. we have this, this here. Okay. But the thing is, with this, um, with this, with the PCNTL, sometimes it's just not enough for the amount of things that we want to do with the process. So most of the times, and I, for me, just like 100% of the times, I need one more library to work with. And that's the POSIX library. The POSIX library is just like an interface for the POSIX, POSIX functions. There's like a, a, it's a set of libraries that are already on Linux, for example, or on your Mac, they're already there. Then PHP has just an interface for that library. So with that library, you can handle uh, group IDs, and you can change group IDs, you can change user IDs, you can change a, a lot of information about the process, and you can also retrieve information about the process, and you can also send message to the process. Um, but as well, as, Sarah, as I said, uh, it also only works on Unix-like systems. So it's kind of a downside, not for me, but for some people, uh, is enabled by default uh, when PHP is compiled. So if you just run compiled PHP and just go to the director and just configure, and then you just run make, this, this guy is going to be enabled already. And as I said, you can manage process, sessions, groups, uh, groups, users, and files as well. So it's pretty much a very broad API for, for the Linux itself, for Unix-like systems. And for example, I'm going to show you this example here. So I have this UID. So you know, as I said, every process already have one user ID and one group ID, right? And here, for example, I'm setting the, the user ID for uh, 501. And then I run POSIX set user ID, have the variable. If this function returns false, it means that I got, uh, I got an error, so things didn't work very well. Then this is how I retrieve error from it. I could just create a message for it, but this is really how uh, we get those messages. So I mean, just uh, also another disclosure, um, like many PHP functions, we usually we have to wrap them up, you know, wrap them up. We can just using the PHP function directly. This just becomes a hassle very, uh, very often. So, if you wanna really go for for this uh, for those <coughs> things, I recommend you guys to look for a library. Um, I have some suggestions, but that's not the focus of this talk. But don't start to write POSIX and PCNTLs in your code because it's going to be kind of a hell. So I can set the user ID and I can set the group ID. And if I got any error, I can retrieve the error. So my process ID is my process ID, my user ID is. So you see, this is a function to set the user ID. This is the function that I'm getting the user ID. This is the function that I'm. Oh, oh sorry. This is the function that I'm getting the user ID. This is the function that I'm setting the group ID. And this is the function that I'm getting the group ID. So if I run this code, what I'm going to get something like this. I'm the parent process. So yeah, uh, imagine that all that fork thing that we wrote before was before. 
So that's pretty much how it will go. I'm the process. Remember that the code that was outputting this thing. So and then the child will do this. Why this is okay? Should we ask questions in between? Well, it's fine. Okay, uh, but uh, how uh, is this limited? Because the first thing I'm going to try is to switch to root. Oh yeah, but that's that's actually not really a PHP thing or a, it's like a POSIX thing. So if you are if you are a user, you cannot become root. You just can't. And actually, if you are a user, you cannot even become another user. If you want to become another user, then you have to be root. So root can is be, is able to switch to any to be any other user, but not the opposite. Yeah, this is a, as I said, it's a Unix limitation. So I have my process ID, then I change the, the user ID, and also change the group ID. Why this is, why this is useful, for example? Uh, when we create daemons, for example, uh, first of all, we create uh, daemons as root, because we need, when we create a daemon, you have to create log files, you have to create, uh, um, yeah, I have to write log files with the process ID, and then I have to like change the user because if you create a demo, for example, you don't want it to, you don't want to, uh, you don't want that this process keep running as root. So you, you want usually what we do is, for example, uh, Apache. If you if you have Apache installed in your machine and you run ps aux or dash AF, depending on how you like it, and you grab all the Apache, you're gonna see that all the process, they are gonna be either with the Apache user or www data. But that process was created as root. But why it was created, why, the, why Apache changed the user to www data? Because if you have a web server that has root access, what, what's gonna happen? Oh, nothing bad no, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what, but. People say that's bad, so I believe that. <laughs> yeah, so that's why. But the thing is, uh, as we were talking about, right, uh, the moment that we fork and the moment that we are like running tasks in parallel, sometimes we still wanted to communicate with the old self, right? So for that, we have inter-process communication. And what is this? Like, if I have two proxies, you must be able to communicate between them. And that's really like about, that's what we're really talking about, we're really gonna start talking about, when do we use it? So, use case, imagine if you have, uh, if you have a website, and you have to send emails after every action, and you wanna send emails with SMTP, and you're just lazy and don't wanna configure a POSIX your machine, but you just wanna send the SMTP authentication directly, for example, that's one thing. Yeah, I think I extend too much. But then, let's see that if you wanna, you don't wanna send an email there, or you don't wanna send a push notification to the user in the moment that of that thing happens. So you wanna to run that in parallel. Then what we usually do, we create a quill, a queue for that, and then we consume the quill uh, and we have like a lot of emails to send and we just send those emails afterwards. So that's pretty much when you're gonna use uh, this multiple process and run testing background because then we're gonna be fast because we're, go we're gonna op optimize the time, we're gonna send multiple messages for multiple users, but we just don't have to depend on doing this in the moment of the action. So that's pretty much how, where we use it. And to this is inter-process communication which means like, okay, because that's, here's, here's the thing. So we have like five emails to send. And we have one guy sending emails for everyone in parallel. So he say, just says, hey, give me five emails and I'm gonna send, uh, I'm gonna send this, these guys. But it's, this thing here happens really quick. And what's really easy to happen and the problems that you're gonna face when you run things in parallel uh, is that, okay, but how do I know if someone got the message for the user one or the other person got the message for the user two? So every process or thread or a fork, they should get, they should get just one 
email. It should not happen that two guys, two processors or, or threads are going to get the same email to send because then we're going to flood and uh, the flood the, the user's email box and that's not lacquer. So <coughs> the thing is, for interprocess communication, there are a lot of options and I'm, I'm not going to talk very much about all the options that we have, uh, not, not in details, but I'm going to tell, tell you guys some. So one thing that is hideous but you also can do, you can create files, right? So imagine if I have two processes running the same machine, or five processes running the same machine, and I just want to know, hey, um, I have this information, and I want to get this information from one process to the other. How are we going to do it? So for example, imagine and I create a child. Um, uh, the, process, the, the process creates a child process. And the parent process has, wants to know when the, when the process finished, for example. We could create a file and just check, and then the, 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 f the, the, ch the child would write on this file, for example, and we could get the, the answer. Another way that is kind of really, really, uh, really, really important if you work with forks is signals. What are signals? Signals are messages that are sent to, to the process IDs. For the, for the, to the process. For example, uh, you guys for sure were like, like, already have to do that sometimes. So you're running up a server and then you're trying to kill the server, right? Then you write kill and then you, first you, you try kill and then you put the process ID and then you gave up and just do Q9 and just, you know, I don't fucking care. It's kind of how we do usually. So this is actually a sign -off. So you see you have the, you, you, you write kill, and then you write your, the process ID. So you're actually sending a message to that, to that process. And the, this, this message can be numbers. And there are different signals. For example, when you, when you press command D, you're like you're running a task on the console, and there's command D, and then you close it, you're sending a sign to this process. When you press command C to cancel, like your, like your AHM, uh, minus R and then slash, for example, you guys should try it. And then <laughs> and it does command C, control C to cancel this kind of command, that's, you're also trying to send a message. So we can send different messages to process. They can even be custom signs. We have this PCMTL signal, and this guy uh, accepts, receives two parameters, the signal number and this, a callback to handle it. So if you're writing a PHP application, for example, do you guys have, a, have you guys tried Behat once? So in Behat, for example, if you're running the tests, and then at a certain point you say, oh yeah, I saw, saw a failure, then you press Command C. And then what happened? We had creates, summarize everything and shows you everything that already run. That's because we had has a specific signal handler for a signal called SIGINT, which is interruption. So PHP units, for example, doesn't have it. So if you have like a lot of tests and you press command C and then you just you just don't know. And I send a PR but Sebastian don't want doesn't want that. Um, and what is this PCNPTL dispatch? It's like, so you have a signal, but every signal that you send to PHP, it doesn't go straight to this guy. There is a trick that you can do, but I'm not even going to talk about it because it has some performance issues. But if you call this guy like frequently, uh, then every time that you call it, it's gonna, it's gonna think, well, do I have signs? First of all, do I have any signs that are, the signals that are, were, that have a callback? So if someone press a command C, then I'm gonna dispatch the, that callback for that signal. That's what PCNTL dispatch does. So with those two functions here, you can define handlers and also uh, dispatch those handlers. As I said, command C, you can create custom things for that. Even someone like want to try to 
queue your program, and then you can just create like a S key with some, you know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and you, you also have POSIX kill. POSIX kill is pretty much how we do on the terminal. So we just kill and the process ID. But one thing that we don't know is that there are a lot of more signs than just the nine. Uh, but that is the more effective if you want to kill the, the process. But there are a lot of different signs. And with that thing, you can, as I said, you can just create like your own sign because maybe you just want to handle that somehow. Semaphores, what are the semaphores? Semaphores is really much what I was talking about before. Like I have two guys trying to do the same thing. With semaphores, I can just avoid this because it's just like a guy, is imagine like a, a traffic, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A traffic light in a road that just goes one car after another. So it's just gonna say, okay, uh, just go. No, you're not gonna go. So it's just gonna pass one at a time. So PHP has some functions for that. So if you're running everything in the same machine, then you can use these functions as sem uh, semaphore uh, and that does acquire and require the functions that you can create semaphores for that. And actual load balanced messages, for example, RabbitMQ, if you consume RabbitMQ, you're only gonna get one message at a time. So doesn't, you doesn't have the risk of getting two messages. Two consumers cannot get the same message twice because that's actually how it works. Shared memory, so if you are running in the same machine, you can create a segment on the, on the memory and then put information on the memory and then multiple because and then multiple processes are going to access this information from the memory message queuing as i said like raptam queues rmq uh, like most uh, ampk uh, based uh, message queues so there's a lot sockets as well is uh, also a way to pass information like sockets per to peer you can just get from the child from the parent and just be exchanging messages from one to another uh, you can open a socket server and just read from that and just this socket server just gonna delegate the message so and also which is hideous but you also can do as the files you can just put on my SQL if you want to but that don't don't do this don't do this but but you can also but the problem is as I said you just don't have control of who got what you know Maybe so you can store files in DBMS as blobs. yes <laughs> oh yeah this guy is genius. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is genius. Brexport hiring, by the way. <laughs> okay, so we have those options, and I'm not gonna really talk about all of them because there are many, and I think I don't have much time. And then here th comes the things. I'm just gonna gonna talk talk to you guys about some tricks that I got from all this time trying to do to make it work. And one thing that I'm gonna tell you. It's not easy, and that's why most people gave up on it, uh, because it's not easy to handle those kind of things. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some stuff that maybe are gonna help you out afterwards. First of all, forks share nothing. So remember when I said the thing with the road, I'm not gonna repeat myself one for the third time, but the thing is, they are different guys, but the process has some permissions already. So if the guy, sometimes when you, when you fork it, maybe the child is not gonna be able to read files or even write files. For that, we have to reset the user mask. So by resetting the user mask, uh, putting a zero, we guarantee that our process is gonna, is gonna have writes to read and to write files. Do not share the, use the same connection. So for example, if you start my SQL uh, connection or a post degrees or any other connection from the parent, don't call this connection the child that are gonna get trouble because as I said, it's, it's the same connection, it's the same connection ID, but now you're trying to do two things. My SQL is gonna get crazy and it's gonna show that the message is really funny. My SQL server has gone away. So yes, that's what my SQL is gonna do with you. So don't do this, don't share connections. And another thing is replace the file descriptors. Because as I said, connections, what are connections? Like 
When you start a process, you also have the connections with the file descriptions. W w descriptors. What are the file descriptors? When you do an echo, hello world, like the fellow was talking about, what you're actually doing, you writing on std out file descriptor. So every process that you create, it has three file descriptors by default. So it has the std in, which is like the output for the program itself, like the, the standard output. We have stdr, which is uh, output only for errors. And we also have the std in, which is actually the input. So for example, you know when you're on the console and, and you just like, write something and then you pipe and you create another thing and then you pipe and you g got another command. I think we maybe probably you guys have, s have seen this before. Um, so you have to close them because they're, they belong to the parent. They don't belong to you. So don't be greedy and get, get, your, get, get, get some for you. So either you can replace them because PHP has support for that or you just don't write to them, you know, just respect your father. And ensure you don't write, on, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And write a lot of logs because it's just, you're completely in the dark. And the moment that you create a fork, you have no idea what's gonna happen. So if you don't log stuff, then you're gonna get crazy. So just log stuff. And also, you have to replace the working directory because uh, that's the thing. The, the parent process was in a directory, but maybe, uh, someone replace that directory or move the directory, then the child's gonna say, well, where am I? I, I, have, I, do, I, I don't know what, what's, what's happening. So we have to replace also the working directory. And the work directory is, for example, when you open your console, you're already on the, your home. And then you CD something, and then you're already on that directory. With PHP scripts, it's the same. So when you run a script, you have already a working directory, and that's what you have to change. If you wanna go to that world as well, which is funny, uh, daemons are completely independent. So uh, daemons are actually forks, but they're even more independent. So first of all, we have to fork and die. So the parent is gonna say, hey, do your missions, child. Um, I'm not gonna do anything anymore. And so you should not keep the parent because you just have to reset. And remember that I said about sessions in the beginning? So you also have to reset the session because imagine like, you start a daemon on your console and then you close your, your terminal. And the daemon, you already, uh, you already changed the, the parent ID you, to win it, but you're, not in this, you're still in the same session, so your daemon is gonna die. So don't let your daemons die, keep it. And you have to save the pit somewhere because daemons usually you have a start and a stop, right? And then you start a daemon. And then when you stop, the demon say, oh, dude, I, I have no idea who I am. I, I don't have an ID. So you have to start the process ID somewhere, then you can kill it or at least check it. So if you're gonna go to this world. About forks, they're single core. So if you have 15 cores in your machine and you just wanna go for forks, you're not gonna use the, f the 15 cores, you're just gonna use one core. So forks are nice if you wanna create demons, but you know, you're not gonna get much gain on it. Also, uh, because forks are completely independent, so if your, if your parent process creates like 15 demons, they're all gonna use a lot of memory and then you have no control of it, so. Fork bomb. Your pardon? Your, then you got a fork bomb. Yes, exactly, and then you got a fork bomb. <laughs> PHP is not multi-threaded by default, as I said, so they're gonna create the same, C the same CPU of the, the parent, so. And about threads, that's the beauty of it. It's gonna respect the memory limit because they share the same slot on the memory. So if you, have, you're, if you have a lot, of course, your program is gonna crash, but you're not gonna crash your machine. That's the difference if you go for threads. Uh, and does it make sense to use threads if you're in a single core? I mean, doesn't, doesn't make sense to have a single core, but <laughs> if you have, just doesn't make sense. Actually, would make sense if you're doing things like sending emails and stuff because then it will send the emails in parallel because it doesn't require <coughs> multiple CPUs. Yeah, but that's the thing. Or you cannot, files, no? because the threads, they're just one, they just run one after another. So one task is gonna start and it's gonna end. It start, it's gonna end. Even if the test switch, like start and then 
this one is going to pause in the middle and start another one. It's two, it's going to be one at a time, so you don't have any save the timing. But if you have two cores, then this test is going to start here, the other test is going to start here, then this one is going to finish, then another one, then another one is going to start, and then you can like do two tests. But if you have just one core, it's just going to be like this task, do this task, then do this task, then do this task. No, but not well, then you still have asynchronous programming. Basically. Yeah, but no, because it, because that's how PHP works. If you start something and you have just one single core, it's just not gonna go to the next one until it's finished. That's the nature of PHP. Okay, so it's not gonna work like, for example, Node.js works. No, no, because okay. PHP is, is is single thread. Yeah, but also and even if you have one core, then it's thread. just d have you tried to work uh, Node in one core? How does it work? Works fine. Well, it works fine because it just as it, it uses a scheduler. So basically, every time that you have to wait, oh yeah. the scheduler is freed up, so it does that. If you have multiple threads on one core, it's basically gonna simulate. Yeah. Being asynchronous. But you don't have. You use threads before multiple core processes. So yeah, but you don't. Thing. Yeah, but you don't have the gain of time because they're all gonna run one after another. They're oh. still gonna need the time. Although they're gonna switch, they're still gonna run, they're still gonna run just one time. You got it? Yeah, maybe that's, that's a disappointment of it's free now. Okay, yeah. Because usually the, everything that you do using files, that was the whole thing why Node.js works better as in the async stuff. For example, you could make multiple requests to different APIs. Mm -hmm. and get the responses even though you have only one processor core it doesn't matter because you're uh, the, the, let's yeah. say the thread that handles requests for files and yeah. connections and so on it's done in parallel so yeah but uh, don't, it's not in parallel yeah. 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 Uh, so the conclusion no. which is yeah uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not trying to sell you guys any idea uh, for example in Vrexpot this company I work, we use supervisor, and uh, the thing is, we just should not discard the possibility of trying at least. And also, if PHP is not mature enough to have those resources, it's pretty much because we don't use it. Because if we start using it, then it's gonna the community is gonna grow, and so on and so on. So, give it a shot, try it. I tried many times, and I'm still willing to try more and more and. That's what is going to make PHP grow more and more. So this is me. Uh, as I said, I'm a software developer uh, focusing on PHP. I work at Verxpot. Uh, by the way, they're hiring. Uh, I also am open source enthusiast. I code a lot of open source projects. There's Respect Library, which is one of the validation libraries that I work on. I also created one, one API for, for uh, to work better with PCNTL and POSIX. It's called Arara Proxys. So if you guys want to check out, this is my GitHub. This is my Twitter that I don't use very much, but I'm, I'm willing to try again <laughs> to start that. And that's it, guys. So thank you very much. Thank you.